Welcome to this, the first episode of the Monday Night Theatre Forum. This uh, theatre forum is brought to you by the Playwrights Workshop Trin Mago. <laughs> and Riman Chukong Productions. Raymond Chukong Productions has been around since 1989. Those of you who don't know, um, Riemann is a, obviously a, an accomplished theatre artist and contrary to what most people believe, it's not just comedies that he's interested in. And even if he were, that is what Molière was interested in, so it's nothing wrong with comedies. The Playwrights Workshop in Bago has been around since 2003 and we are simply a group of playwrights who get together and seek each other's interests. <laughs> if anybody is so crazy as to want to write plays in this day and age. <laughs> so welcome. The, the uh, forum is geared to bring to the fore people who have been laboring out in the fields or the wilderness, if you will, and um, I've almost been forgotten. Yes? Uh, we have two departments of drama or theatre at university level in this country, at least two. University of Trinidad Tobago and University of the West Indies. We have endless drama students, and when I interface with them, I'm always amazed the extent to which they do not know that we even have a theatre history let alone knowing the theatre history. Um, I don't know how the theatre history here is reflected upon. Um, they tell me they study theatre history. When I was at university, we studied theatre history and it started with the Greeks. And I remember asking my professor about Africa and China and India. And he looked at me like I was crazy. What did I want to study theatre history out of Africa for? So I just paused, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we pressed on. <laughs> <laughs> Reading Oscar Brockett. You know Brockett, Michael? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, but sure. he studies Brockett. But Brockett doesn't know that there's theater outside of Europe or North America. Brockett didn't know that. Yes. And my teacher was Brockett's student. Yeah? That's where we go to, yeah. to hell. So. so anyhow, so welcome. Um, one of the things we need to reflect on right off is that in certain parts of the world at this time, this kind of meeting couldn't happen. We take these things for granted here in Trinidad. So much of the world is plunged into all kinds of insanity. Mm -hmm. And so much of the debate about that insanity is just as insane. Yes? So. One of the reflections that's necessary here is the fact that we can be here, we can reflect on art. I will simply tell you and remind you that Plato did not want artists in his Republic. You read the Republic, he spends a lot of time on the military. He talks a lot about the military. And it's questionable whether he really was interested in artists. Yes? When I asked Derek Walker about that, he said, well, you know, the reason he didn't want artists is because artists always make in waves. But, as Derek says, the revolution here is in art. So, we begin. I, I beat that part of the house. <laughs> laugh, 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 laugh all, all you want. BJ Night 1945 is a night in musical history. Also, who was it? Hold up, Lord. Hey, just one hand, Santa B. This is my question. Who here preserves the memory of Railway Douglas? All right, all right. Who cherishes the fame of Lionel Belasco? Uh -huh. And on the night in question, were you there? Were you there? I was in a night 
road. Singing in the black hole that club me rama. When both of us been like it suddenly explode. With a cry like a rocket in this sparks of yonder. Over the roads and from the Yankee base. Young Shagaramas, the gun start to thunder. Like a big bass from mind that was the case. The years are driven and the GIs was leaving. And tears was streaming down Joyce's face. She had a beautiful child, but the father was leaving. For what for a boy is better than peace I can see it now and see this, believe it Were you there? Were you there? The night that peace be bright Were you there? Were you there? On the night that peace be bright I don't think I'm going to I don't think I'm going to I was hearing them when I hear a bugle. People running, screaming. Please declare. They said, please declare. They were singing. Three cheers for the American Eagle. The British Lion and the Russian Bear. I was hearing I don't know what I'm doing. I I not I I that melody that still began. So Japan victory, what Japan is. Were you there? On the night that peace began. Were you there? Were you there? I was there. On the night that peace began. I don't need blood. 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 And boy, the band getting bigger mm. and bigger. Mm. I sent some of the boys down south to make another raid. You send them to give more oil drums again. You're afraid police hold you. A man can't take from himself his wee oil. <laughs> the venerable co hosts, everyone. Hello, everybody. Right, uh, guys. Thank you very much for coming. It is my duty tonight to introduce the man himself. Um, Albert Lavo has been involved in the theatre for over 40 years. Um, he is debatable, debatably. The oldest theater, thespian, the oldest thespian functioning in, in, in Trinidad today. Albert is a di uh, actor, director, producer, um, founding member, and artistic director of the TTW. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Mr. Albert Lefou. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> I am very flattered that as many of you came to this first forum, um, which I found amazingly um, smart <laughs> of these two gentlemen to put in place. There is a, a saying, I don't remember who said it, that um, a life that is not examined is a life that is not worth living. You all probably know where the quote came from. I don't. 
Um, so I thank them for arranging this session to give some worth to my <laughs> existence. Um, it, it comes at a time when our prime, new prime minister is talking about putting the focus on our history. And um, I think that this is a very, very astute move on the part of Tony and Raymond. What is intended here, I think, is to give you some kind of insight into the making of the person that I have become after 80 years. Only 80. Yes. <laughs> Which began in 1935 on 4th of July in Point Appear in the shadow of the oil refinery. Um, I lived there for about nine years. But that, those first nine years, I think, contained almost everything that was going to be repeated repeatedly <laughs> in my life for the next uh, 79, 71 years. You know? Because every day when my, my father was... Uh, a foreman at the um, bond and canning plants. That is when kerosene was a, a very much used commodity in lamps and stoves and so on. And his business was the canning of kerosene. And every evening he came home, we would take off the soil off his pants and so on and take his shoes off. And um, we had naturally, we had no electricity. All, most of the villages had no electricity. And people lived in villages mostly more than the city. We had no telephone naturally. You know? So we, um, he would encourage us to tell stories. He would tell us stories like Nancy, Bo Nancy, so and all that kind of thing. And encourage us to reenact these stories and retell them ourselves which was our first acquaintance of payback, <laughs> payback theater. But, of course, we didn't know these terms then. But um, playing, performing for the, 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 the always growing crowd of my family, it was, I remember, five, six, seven. Every year there was a baby in the house, you know. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, it was a very, the most difficult crowd that you could play to because everybody wants to be a critic you know, about whether you're telling the story right or wrong or something, you know. Even the ones who couldn't tell stories themselves, the little ones, you know. But one got the, in, the knack of performing for that, for that crew and it became a, a, a part of my life. Wherever I went to uh, whichever schools, and I went to a lot of little schools at that time. I don't know if I'm telling this how you want me to tell it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, around about four years old, oh, no, let me go a little further. Uh, about when I was about eight years old, having gone to private schools and government school in, in, in Point Appear, uh, where I was always being required to perform a, uh, a poem or sing a song or something. This became part of a feature of my life, where, whichever school I went to. Because I, I was kind of loquacious, I think is the word. <laughs> My father used to call me chatterbox, you know. So, but I made decisions very early that if they said I am a chatterbox, I like to talk and stuff. Well, that's me. And I'm, but my responsibility is to make sure that I spoke sensibly and entertain, entertainingly and, you know, intelligently or something. So I always set myself on that course to inform my intellect because I was going to talk, and I wanted to make sure that I talk sense, you know. 
is many years later I learned that the most important attribute, asset for an actor was his intellect. And I realized I've been doing this a long time, building up my intellect, you know. Derek Walcott said that and somebody else in the state said the same thing in a different way. I did not know that I was going to be an actor. I mean, that word was not reserved for colonial peoples in Trinidad. There's nothing like a theater here. Um, there's no uh, industry in the theater. But a, a man named Mr. Jack, <laughs> who lived in the other lane, would hold concerts in his house. I'm talking about 1944 and things like that, right? And he would sing songs like Al Joseph's song, Mommy, Mommy, you know, that kind of song, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we, we would go and I can't remember if we paid. It was free to the public. And we used to look forward to Mr. Jack's concert in, 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 on Sunday afternoon. And this is, I did not see a movie, a moving picture until I was about, 13 years old. And that was because the Seventh-day Adventist people were showing the evils of eating pork <laughs> <laughs> in a tent up in, um, in Freeport. But those, those were my happy days. I was really, I looked forward to those first nine years as the happiest that I ever had in my life because my brother and I, we fight, we run up and down the place, we did all kinds of things. My mother was there, above all, she, we had her love and her protection. And my father was there and my sisters were always admiring their two big brothers who were doing all kinds of nonsense. But about, about the age of eight, the whole thing came to a shuddering halt. Because uh, my mother was becoming increasingly ill. She had a mental problem. And um, my father spoke to me and said, well, you know, your mother can't take care of you all, and your, your grandfather of any country, and he needs somebody to help, and so on. And, and you know he loves you, and all that. So they took me up, put me on the, on the train, um, and I cried all the way, as I remember. And I went out to Freeport, Carby Channel, to be, to live with my father from this whole group, noisy group, here in Point of Fear. Me alone. <laughs> I alone. <laughs> and a strange housekeeper for my father. She was the wife of his brother in law. And the yeah separated, divorced, or whatever. And he asked her to well, come and live with me and stuff and take care, you know? And she always boasted, oh, Mr. Lavo never disrespected me. I mean, whatever. Um, but as soon as I arrived, she was the scourge of my entire family. All, to the, all the young children, all the children. But when I arrived, I understood why. Because she said, the first thing she said to me is, you know, I came by a cab, and the cab, you know, Mr. Lavo's place, and they put me in, and I got here, and she looked at me well disapprovingly, and she said, I never like children. 